Okay, folks, we're going to move on with the service. Uh, if you're new here or if you're watching online and wondering what's going on, my name is Bruce. I'm the pastor of this church. Uh, we just had a, a beautiful time to honor our high school seniors, and, and that's really one of the blessings of City on a Hill and, and every year, and to see the kind of connections that we've made, and I'm just thankful I'm not the only one that gets choked up when they're up front every once in a while, okay? It kind of goes around, and if you're out there, if you're watching, you think it's all easy being up front, sometimes it's not so easy being up front, just saying. We may make it look like it's easy, but it's not. Uh, we have started, just this past Sunday, we started a new series in the book of Galatians. If you're here physically in this space, hopefully you grabbed one of these, uh, if you're not here, if you're streaming online, if you'd like a copy, you can contact us and we can get you a copy. It's our gift to you. It is a nifty little way if you like writing notes down to save your notes without wrecking your Bible, okay? Because it has all the text of Galatians and some uh, empty pages to write some things down. And also one more thing about the seniors. If you didn't grab one of the handouts that has uh, pictures of our seniors when they were drooling on themselves, some taking some time last year, uh, and then you know highlights of when they're open house, the details of the open houses. Uh, make sure you grab one of those handouts so you can get up to speed. Now here's the downside of this morning. We had this beautiful expression of love and community with our seniors and their families, and now you're stuck with me. So uh, we're just going to plow right ahead, okay, and pretend like you like me. So Galatians one. We're going to jump into the actual text because we weren't. We just had kind of an introduction, some major themes of Galatians last week. And uh, if you're outlining, if you like outlines, then the first part of Galatians really is chapters one and two, where we get to know Paul. If you remember last week, if you don't remember, I'll tell you that Galatians, is, if it isn't the first letter he wrote, it's one of the first letters that Paul wrote. And he's writing in a situation to a number of different churches in this region, this region called Galatia, uh, that uh, they, they know him, or at least they know of him, but he needs to clarify who he is. So in these first two chapters, he does that. He talks about who he is as an apostle. Uh, we get introduced to uh, his life on the road, so to speak. Uh, a defender of the faith. We get an idea of how he actually does that. And then he gets personal. He reveals more of his own life and how he knows he has been justified through faith. And even to this radical extent, nobody talks like this, at least nobody up till this time of Paul talked about and uh, with using words like being crucified with Christ. Uh, which is my favorite verse, Galatians 2.20. We're going to get there. I can't wait till we get there because it's going to be a ton of fun. But uh, I'm used to that verse. Maybe you're used to that kind of language. But if we could dare to go back 2,000 years when crucifixion was a wicked device of torture meant to prolong agony in death, and then Paul has this boldness to say, I have been crucified with Christ. If you go back 2,000 years, no one talks like that, and no one would want that. And yet Paul embraces this whole new identity that connects himself with being tortured as a criminal by the Roman government. It is kind of fascinating once you kind of step back, so to speak. So this morning, uh, we're going to focus in on just a few verses here at the beginning of the first chapter. So let me begin by reading verses 1 through 5. Paul, like I said, is introducing himself. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. We'll kind of break this apart as we go. Number one, Paul is what? An apostle who extends grace and peace. Now, what is an apostle? He begins just the first three words, okay? Maybe you've heard that being thrown around. Perhaps not, but I, at the very beginning here, I want to try to make some clarifications. What is an apostle? 
well, in a very general, broad sense, a broad understanding of the word, being an apostle is simply one who is sent by God with a message, or uh, an apostle is a messenger, which could apply to a whole lot of different people. Even a, it even applies, in, in some cases in the New Testament, to angels or in, angelic beings, but used in a more narrow in a more specific way, not general, but more narrow, it refers to more of a title. And that's the way Paul is using it. Certainly he understands that he is a messenger of God bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the world, to the, to the non-Jewish world that have never heard about Jesus, would have any concept. So in a general, he's doing that, but in a very specific way, he says, Paul, an apostle... And he, in these first few verses, is establishing that he is an apostle by title or by role or by office, that he fills a particular office. So, let me say this. It's kind of a sidebar or whatever, but I, I want to make something real clear. In, general, in a general way, those who follow Christ are apostles because we're messengers of the gospel. We'll get to that in just a couple minutes. But in a specific way, maybe you hear somebody or you, you've heard of people referring to themselves today as apostle so-and-so. So I'm here to tell you that apostle as a specific office or title, at least in the New Testament, is an idea that is limited to those who were either eyewitnesses of Christ's ministry, as in the first 12 disciples, or those and or those who are commissioned directly by Jesus Christ. And certainly Paul is one of those. And if we took the time, we could see and be reminded of how the book of Acts shows us how Paul was set aside. Christ spoke to him and, and then began preparing him to send him out to the non-Jewish world. So that is Paul, and that is those who are either eyewitnesses or have been commissioned directly by Jesus. So as a role, office, title that has ended in the, New, in the New Testament times or in that first century, there are no more new apostles by that definition. So if anybody claims to be an apostle today, you'd want to begin to ask, why are you claiming that? Is it in a general sense, or is it to refer to a specific title? And basically, I'd say this. If anybody today is trying to reserve or, or claim a certain title for themselves to set them apart from other believers, then that could be an issue of pride going on, okay? Uh, it, there is no other exalted special status. Uh, we are all on the same level, field, level playing field before the cross, right? Uh, by grace, we've been saved through faith and have been set aside, have been gifted, and have been sent all of us together. So beware of that, okay? Uh, it is important for Paul to set aside this title as we'll get into this book and discover uh, that the Galatian believers, they need to understand how his role is different and especially important for these churches at this particular time. So his role as apostle is different than what we see today. So I hopefully, hopefully it's clear as mud, right? I didn't confuse you any more than I needed to. Paul, an apostle, that's different. And there is a contrast. So his status as an apostle is through Christ, not from men. Again, the Galatian believers need to understand who this guy really is. Not from men, not through man, but through Jesus Christ. Now, that might sound like a head trip today if we didn't understand the fuller, the bigger context of what was going on. Oh, I'm so exalted, right? Because I'm better than you because Jesus set me aside. No, they need to understand that already there were different voices, there were different people coming into the church and confusing and frustrating people, believers, as to what the gospel really is. So Paul is clarifying right away, it's not just anybody that has trained me or set me apart or sent me. Uh, I'm not just in any particular school of thought or background. No, I have been set aside as an apostle by Jesus himself for this time for you Galatian believers in your churches. By Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead 
and all the brothers who are with me, okay? So that's the first thing that is very important. And then what does he go on to say? So to these churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. Now, as you read the New Testament and these epistles, these these uh, church letters in the New Testament, uh, all of them have this uh, beginning portion, this salutation, this greeting to, to the people of these churches. Uh, it was typical, it was standard in ancient times, and it carried over to, well, nobody, does anybody write letters anymore? Was the last, anybody write a letter recently? Okay, all right, so there's somebody here, right? And text messages don't count, right? Letters are when we actually use punctuation, Okay. Right, right. Like, what's a period? What's a comma? Okay, so back in the day, whatever. Or possibly some of you still do that. So ancient times, there was always a salutation. New Testament letters, there is always this beginning part, this salutation, and sometimes we kind of skip over uh, the the beginning part because it sounds. If you read through uh, letters in the New Testament, they all kind of sound similar. I mean, right? And, and the ending, sometimes the ending of the letters, same thing. But we can't just gloss over any part of Scripture, and we can't just gloss over salutation and what it is that he says, because it is important to pick up on this message. So look at it again. To the churches of Galatia, what does he say? He says something that in ancient times, and with other people writing letters, that no one else said, unless you were a believer, unless you you personally knew Jesus Christ. You would not say these things. Paul knows Jesus. He has been set aside by Jesus, and because of the rich, life-giving relationship he has with Jesus Christ, he is saying something, not just because he's in charge, not just because he's the big guy with filled with pride and ego and telling people what to do, and, and if you remember last week, there are some things that he says in this book, this letter, that sound pretty angry. You know, calling people foolish, telling them to emasculate themselves. Yes, that's in this letter, okay? Doesn't sound very nice that you would say that to anybody. So there's some things that he says that are pretty angry sounding, okay? So we, we get that, but he doesn't jump to the angry stuff. What governs this letter to people that he is irritated with is what? Grace and peace. That is why he writes to them. And that is the way in which he reaches out to them. He doesn't jump to angry, pointing fingers, how could you be such a foolish idiot, any of that stuff. He says, grace to you and peace from whom? Maybe there's times and maybe there's a way in which he is even writing this, is probably dictating it to somebody else, but as they're writing it down, even feeling irritated because he wants to jump quickly, and he does quickly jump to what irritates him, but he remembers that what? Ultimately, if he is to extend any grace and peace, who does it come from? Who does it have to come from? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who what? Why is that significant? Why is any of these things, why are any of these things important that he talks about? Because he reminds, I believe, he reminds himself in his attitude towards these people, and he reminds the people he's writing to, who is Jesus? He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. Even at the beginning of his letter, there's a doxology. We always sing the doxology here at the end of our service, right? Where that's been a pattern of ours for the 12, last 12 years that we've been worshiping together. It is praise time. We like to end with that, but in some ways, it's just as important to begin with that. He begins with a doxology. So he is focused in the right place, and his listeners are focused in the right place. Do you get that? This is so important. We can't just sail over this beginning part of the letter because it just sounds so similar 
or these are just things everybody says because that's the way they talk. No, no one talked like this except the apostles because they're grounded in who it is that they follow. They know why they follow Jesus. And it's so important for that big picture to saturate what it is, whatever it is, that they are about to communicate with these, pat, with these people. No matter how wrong the wrong is, grace and peace reign through Jesus. You got that? That's got to be known and held on to. No matter what the issue is, it needs to be corrected and addressed and confronted. Grace and peace have to reign because Jesus reigns and that's how he reigns. Got it? That's how we begin, okay? So let's move on here. Paul is an apostle. He extends grace and peace. And also, he is a leader who confronts the problem directly. Here's something, that, something else that's interesting. You look at these other letters that Paul wrote, and there's typically a lengthy salutation. He goes on talking about different things about Christ, or he maybe goes on commending the people he's writing to about uh, different things that, well, that he wants to highlight. But he skips all that and jumps right into those things that are, uh, I guess he's cutting to the chase, to those things he, that are really on his mind. First of all, remember that he's writing to people in this evil age to deliver us, that Christ delivered us from this present evil age. So scholars like to debate, well, what is it that he, you know, what's, what's behind that? Nobody knows for sure, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. It could just be in reference to uh, the church age, that now that we are a part of the church, uh, we are kind of surrounded by those who don't agree with us, who worship a different God, who have different world views. We don't know, but there is a similarity that we need to be aware of. Even though 2,000 years ago, is 2,000 years ago, it's ancient times, uh, these, these faraway places and churches in, in modern-day Turkey that don't exist anymore, cities, all there's left is ruins, right? Uh, and it's tempting to think that uh, it's just an old book with old people and we don't understand. But this present evil age communicates directly, not just to them, but to us. In so many ways, Christian life, following Christ, uh, trying to obey him, to be faithful to him, in so many ways, whether it's ancient times or today, it sets you apart as different. It's painting a big old bullseye on your body in some respects. And there's no avoiding that. Uh, and that's part of this letter. It, you can't compromise when it comes to what the gospel truly is about, the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't dare go there. So uh, there, there are a lot of things that we could say with that, but I think this present evil age is an age that we're all a part of, no matter, as believers, no matter what century that we live in. Okay, so he goes on uh, to get, you know, cut to the chase here in verse six, and he says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Tough, hard, edgy language, right? So, number one, take this into account here, okay? He, he says, I'm, I'm so astonished. You're quickly deserting. Uh, the word that, we, that the ESV translates deserting uh, doesn't just mean leaving somewhere, okay? It also means coming to a different location. So it's bad enough if you're in the military, we got somebody headed to the West Point, she's going to learn a whole lot about military stuff, right? It's bad enough to, the, you, military stuff, man, I'm so intelligent. Okay, so it's bad enough to be in the military and to be a deserter. 
it's far worse to desert your company and then join in with the opposing side, army, whatever, and then start shooting at the people that you used to be in company with and serve with, right? So when he says desert, not only are you leaving the gospel, but you're going to a place where you're aiming back at the people you said you used to love. That's a stark kind of accusation for these Christians that he jumps right into. You are joining the wrong side. Now, uh, nobody likes to be accused of anything. Nobody likes to have something pointed out. But he goes straight to the reality that for many of the believers is troubling and painful. And to many of the other believers, they are indifferent to. Because I'm doing what I think is right. And who are you to say otherwise? And we've got this hot mess mix of people that are, some are trying to remain faithful to the fellowship to believers while others are deserting and are kind of thumbing their nose at everybody else. That is the background, it briefly, that's going on, which is why I believe he uses the language that he does twice. He emphasizes it, right? He re basically repeats himself. If we, and he includes we, he's including himself. Even if I came back and said something different, I should be cursed, okay? He throws himself into the mix. If we, or even an angel from heaven, if, some, if you think you, some angelic being has shown up and is telling you something contrary to what it is we taught, he's trying to cover all his bases because he doesn't know who these people are that have come in to distort the gospel or what authority they are claiming, okay? So he is casting that net really wide. If anybody comes in and distorts, confuses, changes the story, the gospel story that we gave you, let them be accursed. Wow, that's, that's harsh language. New Testament is not love, right? Jesus came to, to give us love and, and, and we all hug each other. But there is a situation that there is a line, so to speak, that you don't cross. And that is changing the good news of Christ into something that it is not. Now, a uh, couple things going on there. Let me see if I can remember here. Uh, number one, he is trying to, I think he's trying to do this. Uh, as we'll see, he, he's speaking of, uh, throughout this letter, he's, he's addressing those who are trying to bring the law of the old, the old uh, uh, covenant law into a gospel uh, add-on kind of mix. And if there are those in, in those churches that understand or know of the old covenant law, then they are also aware of the blessings and curses that come with it. So secondly, if they are embracing a different teaching, then they are cursing themselves. It's not about Paul or anybody else wagging her finger or giving them some guilty death threat or whatever. If they are embracing the wrong gospel, they know there's blessings and curses that if you don't follow the covenant, uh, you are inviting curses on you. If you don't perfectly follow the covenant, you are cursed. You will take on a curse. So I, I think right away he's highlighting those of you who think you find life in perfection, tell the truth. You, you can't. You can't find it. Why in the world would you exchange the gospel of grace and peace and truth with something else that goes back into a system that you know you broke? I think it's a wake-up call. You are cursing yourself with a load, with a burden, that if you're honest, you'll admit you can't bear. That's what he's bringing out. So even though it sounds kind of harsh and that's not very nice, so why would he curse people? It's really, really, they're cursing themselves. They're bringing on a burden that they can't bear. One more. Paul is an apostle, he extends grace and peace. He is a leader who confronts directly and boldly what it is that's going on and speaks directly into that. And also, he is a servant who knows exactly who it is 
he is serving. One last verse this morning. For now, I am, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We've been talking about service a lot in our Element series, talking about spiritual gifts, and one of those is serving. A number of people that I've talked to over the last couple months have identified themselves as they you know, do the inventory as someone who has a gift of service. That's an awesome thing. So many times there is a blessing, not just to those who are being served, but as that, that gift of service is being expressed to those who have that gift. Uh, the secondary blessing, if you will. As, as you express that gift and use that gift, uh, you experience more of, of peace and, and, and fulfillment knowing that God is using you. You're serving somebody, and it matters, right? It's an awesome thing. So as you serve, or even as Paul serves Christ and the Galatians, there's a blessing to that to them and to himself. But here's the other deal. Other times, service... To Christ, as Paul experiences it for sure, can be lonely and can invite trouble. And nobody wants that part of the gift. I mean, right? Uh, to, to feel fulfilled and blessed is an awesome thing. We all want that. I want that. I, I kind of like that. But there are some times when you serve, it is the opposite that you receive. And nobody wants that part. Paul's approach to the problems that are evident, that are here in these churches is clear, it's bold, and it's direct. And he right away says, hey, I'm, I'm not in this to win a popularity contest. I, if I were, I wouldn't be serving Christ and I'd be telling you what you want to hear, which is exactly what these other guys are doing. And in other places, even to the Corinthians, Paul has to make sure that they understand clearly I know I'm not the best speaker. I know that there are other guys that are coming to your church that are awesome, and they're charismatic, and everybody loves them, and I'm just a guy who doesn't speak all that great, uh, maybe kind of comes across crusty. I just wonder if Paul, there's so many of these biblical people that we're introduced to and just barely know, right? I just wonder if Paul were like a, a visiting preacher, if he knew English, and if he could come up here, what, and not just what would he look like, I always wondered that, but how would he come across? I don't get the feeling from what he tells us that he would come across like somebody that you'd see on TV, uh, somebody who is, you know, really charismatic or showy or uh, has got the skinny jeans or whatever. Does anybody wear skinny jeans anymore? I, I pray that that's over. Anyway, I don't think Paul, I don't think Paul will do any of that stuff. He knows who he serves, and because of that, he takes all of the junk. And he's okay with that. The service to Christ sometimes invites all that stuff in. And that means you're not going to be the popular one. You're not going to be upfront. You're not going to be happy some of the time. That's not, that, that's not the point of what it is that Christ has called Paul or sometimes many of us into. What is he doing? There is a contrast so many times. Paul couldn't say the things that need to be said if his goal was being popular with these people. He wouldn't. Pull his punches, he'd withdraw, he'd say it in a different way. He compromise in some way. Jesus is clearly the goal of his efforts. Jesus is the point of his ministry. The gospel of Jesus Christ has to be preserved, cannot be compromised. And that means, in, in many ways, it's kind of black and white what it is he's doing in contrast and comparison to what else is going on in the Galatian churches. So to wrap this up, I want to say a few things to bring these points into perspective for us. I want to address specifically our graduates. I'm not going to make you stand up. I was tempted to. <laughs> but you already had to stand up for a long, awkward period of time. Everybody stared at you. So I'm not going to do that again, okay? But I am calling you out right now. 
Because of the fact that you are graduating, and not just high school graduates, we have at least one college graduate here, and maybe others that are watching, and not just academic graduates. Because you know what? We, in, in a way, we face graduation every day, don't we? Every day is an opportunity to then step out into the unknown, right? So what is it that marks our stepping out? What is it that we need to consider, even from these introductory verses of what Paul is talking about? So consider this. I already talked about title of apostle, right? So that doesn't really exist today as an office like what Paul talked about. But all believers should take their apostolic ministry seriously. Now that's something that I don't say, well, I don't know, ever. I've never said apostolic ministry. And maybe you've heard that in different contexts, in different ways. So let me be very clear of what I'm talking about. Because I'm not talking about a title or a role or some way to feel prideful or I'm better than others because I got that word in front of my name. It's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about comes from Ephesians chapter 2. I don't have it on the screen. As Paul, another letter by Paul to a different church. And as he's clarifying things and what's going on, with their place in the world, as they're stepping out in this world, he says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, chapter 2, verse 19, but as believers, together as a community, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The image is a building rising up from the foundation. Jesus is a cornerstone. Everything squares by him. The next level of foundation is all that the apostles taught. They believed. They transferred onto the believers of the first century. And the rest of us are built onto that foundation that continues to grow as more people come into the kingdom. You follow me? That's Ephesians chapter 2. So we cannot truly be built on that foundation and at the same time reject what it is that it teaches or where it is leading us. The mission in general and the commission of the apostles is what we then transfer and build on and become a part of in this glorious church building community that that Christ is creating. So in that sense, we do have an apostolic ministry. What they were commissioned to do and sent to do, we are as well. So we cannot in any way reject it or ignore what that mission is. That's critical. So number one, graduate or not, we're all in this together. Especially graduates. Can I pick on you just a second? Especially graduates. I really want you to, this to sink in, okay? Because the world that you're, you're being sent into is so different than the world I was in. I am so old. Everybody knows that. But it is so critical. It's so critical to stand out as a follower of Jesus and not just anything, because that truly is the book of Galatians. Number one, extend grace and peace. I was listening to... Um, uh, NPR this past week, and how they had a, di- a number of different pieces that they ran this past week on a number of demonstrations that are happening, not just in D.C. and all over the country. Uh, all of it comes from that leaked document from the Supreme Court. Everybody knows that. You've, re- you've heard that, okay? Um, and how'd they put it? They, they began every uh, uh, interview with, we're entering a summer of rage, Okay? Not just dissent, not just problems, not just, you know, political whatever. A sum, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got that right. Because it was a, a word chosen to really get your attention, right? They're trying to get me to keep listening, not flip the channel. A summer of rage. We are entering, I think, a political uh, scenario here that's going to be different than at least most of it, it depends on how old you are. If you lived through some of the political upheaval in the 60s, uh, I'm not going to call any names right now, but you saw a whole different uh, version of the country, right, than what we've seen for a long time. 
But, you know, it used to be you see the maps, the, the red and the blue states on the maps, you know, every political uh, runaround. I, I think that's going to be codified after this coming election series. So that's as political as I get. I'll move on, okay? What in the, in the, in the current, not just political, but the polarization in our culture, that there, there's no middle ground. You are instantly, as soon as you open your mouth, you're instantly way ex extreme, okay? What sets a believer apart in the frustration of polarizing conversations? It's exactly, because this also, in Paul's situation, could have been very polarizing. You're one side or the other, right? But what does Paul do? Extend grace and peace. What if, in your conversations, graduates, and in your in poli sci or your, whatever class situation you're in, what if you extend grace? And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm, I am saying you got to be praying about it uh, and be mindful and aware, intelligently grasping what's going on. But what if you go a third route? What if the words that you share, what if the ideas that come out of your mouth are seasoned with this beautiful, Christ-inspired grace and truth. You know what can happen? What has changed people for centuries can happen. Somebody listens and goes, you're not on the left or the right. I want to know more. That's grace and peace. That's what comes from a, 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 a solid, knowledgeable, established relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't think that's important? You don't think that's other places? Well, it is. So let me point something out. Romans chapter 12, another letter that Paul wrote, okay? Romans chapter 12, he is establishing for his readers, for the believers in the Roman churches, what does it mean then to actually apply all the stuff that he wrote about? What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? He talks about in chapter 12. He gets into all sorts of specific things that aren't just applied to the brethren, aren't just for the fellowship, the, the relationship with other believers, okay? It truly is that, but it's so much more than that because you don't just relate to other Christians, do you, ever? So what does he, what does he stress? Well, rejoice with those who rejoice, verse 15, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, verse 16, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Okay? Let that sink in. For today, for us today, okay? If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In the two, the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do you do that? Grace and peace. It's seasoned in every way that you relate, in every way that you talk to people. That's how you heat burning coals on somebody's head. You, you, don't, you don't read that and think, it's, oh, I, it's a getcha moment, right? My apologetic is so amazing that I've reduced you to nothing in how I have just I've broken down your arguments and left you feeling idiotic. And now I'm going to convince you of the love of God, right? It's not that. The burning coals are self-inflicted. Because everything, it fits with the context. Everything that he's talking about is how Jesus reached out and changed his life. If there's any burning coals, it's, it's experienced by someone who goes, I, my head and life are on fire because I realize what this person is saying is true. And my immediate reaction is, I can't take it. You ever had a conversation like that? I hope you have, and I pray that we have more of them. The reaction that says, this doesn't make sense. I can't take it, and there's got to be something else. 
and there is, and it's the gospel. We need new young people entering not just college, but people entering the workforce that extend grace and peace in the way that they relate to others. Now, I spent a long time on that, but it, it follows what Paul says and what we already talked about. Confront directly and boldly obey Christ, not people pleasers. That's what Paul emphasized. We've got to know clearly, and I'm not saying this is easy, to both extend grace and peace, but it doesn't mean you're a doormat. It doesn't mean you just roll over, and okay, whatever, I'll believe whatever. No, it doesn't say that. It, it does mean that you know who you obey. You're not a people pleaser, but with a sincere heart, you what? So many times in the, in the New Testament, we're told to fear the Lord, to fear the, have reverence and awe and appreciation uh, for who Christ is. And if you do that with all sincerity of heart, growing in your understanding of the fear of the Lord, then that bleeds out in the way that you reflect him, in the way that you engage people. Full of grace and peace, but not as a doormat. Know what it is that you believe and speak boldly about that. And finally, know it is who you serve. You don't serve people and their changing opinions. Man, that's, that's everywhere. And, and even more so, in a harsh way. We, there's no way you could do that. <laughs> but especially now, we've got to make sure that no matter what the opinion is served up today, it's not me. I know who I serve, and I know who I follow, and I'm keeping him, no matter what the struggle is, no matter how difficult it is, I'm keeping Christ the center and the focus of what it is and where I am going. And that love and that obedience dictates and measures out my response and everything else. Extend grace and peace, confront directly and boldly, and know who it is that you serve. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you with, our, with humbled hearts, humbled before your word, humbled because of the grace that we have received, the grace that we read about. We know, Jesus, this isn't just religious talk. We know that you gave your life that in this exchange, we win as you lost on the cross. But in your life, we find true life, never-ending life, life filled with meaning and purpose. Lord, I pray that this morning as we, as we finish in worship, as we think about you, that we would be enthralled with you and by you. And in response to that, Lord, give us a new outlook and how we can re react and respond to the needs of the people that are present around us. Grace and peace. Lord, we've received it. Lord Jesus, show us how we can give it and just give it away and give it more and more. That as we speak, Lord, give us the words in the moment, just as you promised your first followers, so that we would by faith know and respond and be obedient and to say what it is you'd want us to say. Be so in step with your spirit that we would be in tuned to what those words could be. And Lord, fill us with a desire to serve you first, to know who it is that we follow, and to have a growing and building desire to not compromise in any way. Lord, work in our lives in that way we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.